Hi everyone. Oh my goodness, you're all so attractive. How nice. Uh, thank you so much for uh, Chris and Lindsay. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, I usually have media cover fleet farming and we have to talk about, you know, what kind of greens are going in the ground, you know, what techniques are you using. And they actually called me and said, you have the opportunity to go on a tangent. So I'm about to take you all on a trip through Narnia in my mind. <laughs> Okay, this is going to be exciting. Um, but just out of a social experiment, I'm curious, how many of you have some type of edible landscaping or gardens at your house? I knew you were going to raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six. So that means the majority of you, majority of you do not, right? Thank goodness, because I don't either. Oh my goodness, like my house is barren. I am way too tired, it is way too hot, and I am way too busy farming other people's lawns to farm my own. So I feel like a lot of us have that same feeling of we can't, you know, I just don't have the time, I just don't have the energy. But unfortunately, and fortunately, as you can tell from social media, you're scrolling and every other post is some kind of natural disaster or some kind of travesty or devastation that's happening to the environment. And you just know that these farms are the future. It's inevitable but you're too tired, you're too, you're too, it's too hot, so what's the solution? Um, so that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Fleet farming, I believe, is one of those solutions, but let's go back to the past, shall we? That's me and my crew. <laughs> and that little Afro baby right there, that is me. Um, I grew up in uh, southeast Boston in a city called Fall River. And I grew up, I'm going to hit you like Disney right now. I'm going to be real sad in the beginning, and we're going to get happy towards the end. Um, I grew up in a food desert. I grew up in the projects. This is actually the uh, project called Sunset Hill that I lived on. I had a mother who was a recovering addict and a father who was physically and, and mentally and emotionally very abusive. Um, so what was going on inside of the household, uh, this was what it looked like for me to escape to. This was the outdoors. This is where I spent most of my childhood. And uh, the reason why I bring that up is because, look at it. Do you feel happy? Do you feel happy looking at that? No, you don't, because it's not really that good of a release, you know, but it was my release growing up. And I remember my mom um, feeding me peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for dinner and just crying. And I used to think, I love peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. They're awesome. You know, why are you crying? This is great. Um, all right. Now, I just want to show a little parallel between the projects that I grew up in, um, some of the residential areas in Paramore, Austin, and then the wealthier neighborhood in uh, Baldwin Park. Do you see a difference by a show of hands? Now, I see a difference, but I just see the structures as a difference. I don't see, I still see a really stagnated, sterile environment. I don't really see a whole lot of uh, joy uh, being represented in the landscaping. It kind of looks just as dreary to me from one to the next. Um, but the houses are prettier. Then you could have this. Not to brag, but this is one of my best, my best work right here. <laughs> my best work. Um, from a business standpoint, you know, the, a lot of you, you're young professionals, and so you probably understand this. If you're putting time and energy towards something, shouldn't you have a return? In my opinion, when you're spending that time and energy, and maybe even money, cutting your grass over and over, you're not getting any type of return. And so it doesn't really make sense that you're not utilizing your property to the fullest extent. And I understand you're tired and, and you don't have the resources, but I believe that when you reach out and you branch out to the community, collectively you can do a lot of work in a very small amount of time. And you can beat those complications that you experience when you are tackling something like putting a garden on your lawn. 
Now, when we were moving on up from the projects, we came to Orlando, and uh, this is actually Deltona. This is right around the corner from where I lived. And something I just, I would love for you all to see the way I see. We are now all in these squares, these boxes, right? And I chose this picture because do you see where food is being produced? Do you see where dairy is being produced? Do you, it's all happening like away. It's all happening like over here, more so than right in the middle. And to me, that's the problem. That's one of the largest issues, is that we are disconnected from the process. We're all living in these cookie cutter houses with these lawns that, you know, nobody's utilizing for anything other than just the aesthetic. And no one knows each other. I always used to joke that I could walk down the street naked, which I never did, and no one would even know because we're all inside, it's too hot, our blinds are closed, and we're all separated from each other. And that's why you have these really patchy, really sad looking properties. And uh, we're all just kind of disconnected from that process. <clears throat> now, I had a gentleman tell me, I love my grass, because when my kid goes outside and plays ball, he doesn't have to worry about any obstructions during his game. And I thought, that's awesome that you bring that up, because you have a driveway where you could easily play catch. You can play catch at the park. But where can you teach a child how to properly harvest tomatoes? He had no answer. And so part of what I feel is a really important factor of what we do is that we teach children and adults how to respect and feel responsible for the product in which they're putting into their body. And that will cause a chain reaction in everything that we do. So a lot of the kids nowadays, they eat food and then they throw it all over the kitchen and they create these big messes. And I really believe, I don't have a child soon, but not anytime soon. Um, I really believe that when you have a child and they're connected to that process, they take value in the food and therefore they will not waste. Why would a kid throw a tomato across the room at you? They probably would anyway. But why would they, if they actually spent the time to plant the seed, water it, watch it grow, harvest it, and then when they have it on their plate, they're gonna say, I'm gonna eat this because I created this. It's going to taste that much more delicious because they had a direct connection to the process. And it's just food, right? It's just food. But is it? Because in my head, this can tie to every single part of our culture. Now, reduce, reuse, recycle, we all say that. But um, a friend of mine, who I'm going to bring up later, they like to say refuse. Here's how I think of that. Reduce, so you reduce what you spend, what you buy, what you make your purchases on. Reuse, so finding a chair on the side of the road and repurposing it into a flower pot. You know, reuse things. We've lost that. Recycle, actually taking plastic, putting it into the recycling bin, breaking it down, reconfiguring it into something else. Recycle, but refuse. Do you really need a straw? that's in a pl plastic bag, that's been in a box, that was shipped in another box to the store that you're just gonna use for one time use, that's gonna just get disregarded, you can refuse. And over time, that can kind of have this ripple effect. You know, you don't have to constantly consume. You can pick and choose how to refuse. Otherwise, you get this. It is the most fun and most terrifying thing if you Google Black Friday shoppers. I enjoy it and at the same time am emotionally affected by Googling Black Friday shoppers because <laughs> it's actually, I think, a social experiment that we should really take some more data on. The fact that people wait outside for hours, push each other around, in order to consume things, to buy, purchase, 
that the shirt doesn't fit right, I'm just going to shove it to the back of my closet. Or the TV is a little too big, so I'm just going to turn it in and get a new one. I feel like when you go back and you learn that value and respect, even if it just starts with just food, it'll influence your habits to the point where you'll have less of this. Or you could have this. This is my buddy, Rob Greenfield. You may have heard of him. He's the trash guy. He does not smell bad, believe it or not. He's awesome. He stayed with us at our headquarters for a couple months, and I had no idea about what he does. He's actually literally a trash man. What he does is he travels throughout the country, and he does dumpster dives. And he comes back and makes these beautiful exhibits where he displays all of the perfectly good food that was disregarded, discarded in the um, trash cans all across the country, from CVS to Walmart, Publix. And then he actually gathers this data and quantifies it in order to create studies of look at all of this waste. I thought it was a cute concept, but it didn't really hit me until he was staying with us. And after one dumpster dive, he brought home more than 30 huge boxes of food. And I was digging through this, and most of the food was perfectly good. Didn't, have, didn't even come close to the expiration date. Perfectly packaged, didn't touch anything gross. I've been eating it for like six months. I'm living off of it, to be honest. Um, reason why I bring that up is because there were, <laughs> back when I lived in the projects, I used to cry because my mom, I would beg her, please, I want Lunchables. Do you remember Lunchables? Those little squares with like the little like cracker and then the little, bless you, square cheese with the little piece of ham. It was like, mom, if I'm gonna be cool, cause I'm already weird, I need Lunchables. And she would always say, honey, I'm sorry, they're too expensive. Honey, I'm sorry, they're too expensive. There were like four or five huge boxes of perfectly good Lunchables in the trash. And not to mention that there were boxes of water bottles, this happened during Flint, Michigan, wrapped up in you know, plastic wrap, just chucked in the trash. Your first question is why, right? Why, how? I don't understand. I don't understand, but this is why. Because vendors, grocery stores, firms, they are supplying the demand. That is their job. It's not necessarily their fault. They could definitely manage it better, but when the demand, when we are hungry for more continuously, they have to meet that demand. That is what they are here for. And so this surplus is the result of that. Because when you, you, you know, spending behavior is not a consistent pattern, it fluctuates. And so let's say that Lunchables are a hot commodity this month, but next month, because school's out, the, the spending patterns have gone down, but the supply is still coming in, and so naturally, you, you would rather keep your shelves stocked, right? and just disregard the old, put in the new, and who cares, it's gone. Your house is over here, everything else is away. So typically, managers don't monitor, they don't, they don't care, they just toss, right? And now I get to talk about why I get up in the morning. Like, I love my job. If you don't love your job, get out now. Find a job that you love, because it changes your life. Nutritional, physical, and emotional health. I have the job where I get to tie in every single part of who I am into this organization. I have suffered from a lot of depression. I have suffered from physical health. I don't have the best diet, believe it or not. And in, in Having to incorporate myself into this organization, I've learned so much about how to properly take care of yourself in ways that you don't even understand, which we're going to talk about. 
I love it when people come out to our free community swarm rides and they say, oh my god, I haven't been on a, on a bicycle in 10 years. Not going to happen. And then I get them on a bike because I peer pressure them. <laughs> and they have the time of their life because they are playing. Because they're playing. And even though there's all these things that are connected to our program, you know, environmental causes that we're trying to help, all of the, you know, physical diabetes that we're trying to fight, all of these health issues that we're trying to fight. The fact that this 60-year-old woman is on a bike having the time of her life, that is another form of health that people don't really understand or see on the surface level. Community, like I said, I suffered from depression before I started working with fleet farming. I currently have a roommate and I have friends that are all in my age bracket that are depressed. Depressed? How? We have phones that give us every single potential option of something to do and people to talk to at all times, anytime, anywhere. How can you feel isolated and depressed and alone? You have an app that you can swipe and meet someone. No strings attached. Isn't that crazy? I mean, I'm from the 90s, so I don't feel like I'm that far out. But to me, that's insane that we have that access accessibility, and yet there are still people who can claim that they're depressed. So within our organization, I'm really pushing to build a tribe, a tribe community, where together, people of all different age brackets, all different genders, all different, you know, um, just parts of life and parts of the community come together and they work towards something big, like a huge farmlet. And everyone is given a small task. And when they stand back, they're all just hit with this emotion of togetherness. Even though they don't know each other, they might not ever see each other again. But they might come back to another event and be ecstatic about the fact that they know everybody there and you slowly start to build a tribe. It's magical. So, I really believe Fleet Farming is going to save the world. <laughs> One of the solutions that will help in contributing to saving the world. We are trying to solve the environmental issues, the social issues, the economic issues, because we're creating leaders, we're supplying jobs, and the sustainability issues of our community. And slowly as we expand, we'll be replicating and multiplying this and hopefully influencing people all across the world. Thank you. Let's go. Um, so we are currently in Audubon Park, not too far from here, over by Easton Market, that's where we meet on our bi-weekly community free swarm rides. Uh, 9 a.m. every second and fourth Sunday, we meet with our bikes, skateboards, rollerblades. You can walk. It's not that far. We have a, an electric golf cart. And we ride together to a farmlet, and we teach you how to farm for free. Best part of the job, in my opinion. Now, if you'd like to donate your front lawn, that's typically the farmlet side of our program. You donate your front lawn by registering your home online, one at a time when I'm ready to expand, because I have to expand based on demand. So if I meet a new vendor that wants to buy, that wants to sell our produce, I'll open up a new farmlet in order to supply that demand to the vendors. Um, I will look on this map and find your house that you've registered, and I will hand select it as the farming coordinator, which now I'm becoming the director. If you would like an install, installation part of the program, you, in, which means you do not donate your greens, you do not donate your lawn, you're buying raised beds because you're out of our biking vicinity. We only stay within a two mile radius of East End Market for the farmlet program. But a, we have about 700 inquiries in Orlando alone. So in order to make everyone feel connected to this, we've offered the installation side of our program, 
where we will come out to your property and install a raised bed, which will be set up on a drip irrigation system, and it's very low maintenance. But if it starts to get leggy and crazy, we offer for $35 an hour to come out, rip everything out, completely put in new compost, reseed, and you just get to sit back and enjoy. So all of that information can be found on fleetfarming.org. And if you want my card, I brought a bunch, just let me know. I would love to come out, because then, you know, you have your little garden, and then you invite me over for a cookout, and then, you know, we can just hang out. That would be really cool, because I need more friends. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, if somebody does have a raised bed and you go and rip it out because they, they like to look at it and don't like to do the maintenance, do you then use that as compost for some other portion of your business? Um, so I like to rip up, chop up, and till into the soil because those roots have tons of nutrients, lots of nitrogen that in tilling it back into the soil, it, you're just refeeding. It's all part of the process. Something that's interesting is when you cut your grass, right? The grass that's there is pulling nutrients from the soil. And then you cut it. And then it's got to pull more. It's hungry. It needs to pull more. And then you cut it. And then it's got to pull more. And then you wonder, why is my grass patchy? Why is there just this dry sand? It's because it's pulling all the nutrients out. And then when the nutrients are gone, the grass doesn't grow there anymore. And that's why cutting your grass is such an issue. Sorry, I went on a tangent there. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. So we do uh, like private swarm rides. Um, so you can bring your company out to just a regular swarm ride, but if you like a private swarm ride, um, that's where we'll actually be taking the time to create a lecture around the swarm. You can email us, and we do offer those education events. We do, we'll, we'll come out and do lectures, we can do presentations, or we could do private swarm rides, which is really cool. I'm trying to create new events as well, but that's a secret, that's on the DL. Not that I'm being recorded or anything, but... <laughs> I'm trying to, in Audubon, expand our events so that it, a lot of people work or go to church on Sundays and they miss out on our swarm rides. So I'm trying to create other events so that we can make sure that you know, everyone can feel like they have an opportunity to volunteer. Yeah, give me some hard ones, man. I mean, I want to be on Shark Tank here. What's a swarm ride? Ah, swarm ride. So, fleet farming. We ride together as a fleet, and we take on climate change. Rah! So swarms, just like bees, we swarm together and ride our bikes, right? So it's all kind of funny environmental puns, which are right up my alley. I'm really bad at puns, but vegetable jokes and like bee jokes and bug jokes, totally me, totally me. Uh -huh. and, and you are full-time, so we have two, um, we have two paid employees, excuse me, three paid employees, soon to be five, in just Audubon. Our operational costs include um, the bags, stickers, marketing materials. We do not pay rent currently, um, but any type of merchandise, you know, that we have, the shirts, which you can get at fleetfarming.org. Um, also, you know, we teach people how to farm, and nine times out of 10, the people who come out to our swarm rides are not experienced. And so, unfortunately, and fortunately, because I love that we have this many volunteers, we lose a lot of scissors, we lose a lot of, sh we, shovels get broken pretty much every time. So we're constantly having to put the money back into the tools in order to keep the education side of the program running. So, yeah. So you're, but it's still mostly on kind of, relative to a lot of companies, you don't have a lot of overhead, it's tools, and basically mm -hmm. some Bike repairs, bikes. always pretty much every day. I bet you if I go to work right now, one of the bike's tires are, are ripped. Um, so we have a headquarters in Audubon, and everything is stored there. I don't really want to give the exact location, 
<laughs> but um, I would highly say, if you have the time, everybody write this down on your phones. It's a fun date, too. Chelsea Street is where we have Chelsea Street in Audubon Park. There's an Audubon Covenant Church that's right in the middle. They have a farmland on, on their huge property. Just take a drive. Get a little coffee, take a drive down Chelsea, and go see my work. Not my work, our work. Because that is the Fleet Street, where we all kind of have farmlets right down the street from each other. It's very convenient when you're biking. You can kind of separate people into different groups and tackle different farmlets all within one swarm ride. You had a question? I did. Um, do your swarms ever get too big? Do you have to like have people sign up first, or is that not a problem for you? The bigger, the better. Um, we had 55 swarmers come out. I think I have a picture, actually. We had 55 swarmers come out to our last swarm. No, this probably, I already took it out. We had 55 swarmers come out, and our swarm ride was done in like an hour. That's awesome. I don't think that the pictures do it justice. Just one row gets me like 10 pounds of produce a week. A week. A week. A week. Why are there still people that are hungry? I don't understand. The surplus is mind-blowing. And it really isn't that hard. Yes, it's hot. Yes, I'm tired. But together, I can get about 90 pounds of produce in an hour because People are bringing their kids out, and it's a fun family activity, and it's really effortless when you're just doing a little and you're just one person, but that one person being replicated into 55 people, doing that little bit together when you're done, you have 90 pounds of produce and you're scratching your head like, what am I going to do with all this? Which we've been very resourceful. We've found a lot of, you know, we make sure we have very little waste, we've minimized our waste, but eventually when I drop the little hint about wanting to build new events, I kind of, okay, I just want to give you a little taste of what I'm trying to work on. I want to do a snip and stroll where you go and you take your basket and you snip your weekly groceries and it's like a huge event. You know when you go picking for blueberries? Wouldn't that be cute if you can pick for lettuce or watermelon? We get a lot of random tomatoes that come up out of nowhere, and I think it would be really cool if I can incorporate, on a random day, it could be like a Wednesday, you just go out with your basket and you harvest your lunch, and then you go back to the office. That's something I'm trying to work on, but yeah. Um, two questions. Um, I know you use local roots uh -huh. inside East Penn Market. Do you also um, sell to homegrown co-op? And then the second part of the question is, Absolutely. Right now, we sell to Lazy Moon Pizza. We sell to both of their locations. We sell to Sanctum Cafe. They're a vegan cafe off of Fern Creek and 50. We sell to uh, Homegrown Co-op, which we're actually donating a farmlet because their, their front grass was driving me insane, so I offered to pay out of pocket for a farmlet. And so we're donating a farmlet to them on May 24th. So write that in your calendars because it's going to be really fun. And so we sell to them. We sell bags of greens. I highly recommend you go to Homegrown and Pharmacy, which is right around the corner from here. Pharmacy, we're starting a partnership with them soon and they want to be selling our greens as well. Um, these are two organizations that really push for local Florida grown or central Florida grown food. Local can mean several things. It can be USA, it can mean state, and it can mean hyper local, like central Florida. And the pharmacy and homegrown are two locations that really push for hyper local food. And so I'd love for you all to just take an afternoon and go there and just see what they, they offer. It's really amazing. We also sell at Florida & Co. in East End Market Red Light, Red Light just emailed me. They said they want to make a beer out of some of our, our produce. I love beer. How awesome is that? I can't wait to give them some ideas because I have crazy ideas for that. 
And um, yeah, and so, and then you said, oh, repeat. So we meet every second and fourth Sunday of each month, rain or shine, 9 a.m. at East End Market, 9 until about 11.30 and we ride together. You, I highly recommend bringing a bike, but there are bikes there that are first come, first serve, supplied by juice bikes. And, um, you know, a water bottle, hat, sunscreen. You know, let's have fun, but let's be safe, too. Have you ever had a line that makes you work out? Or, like, how do you, if you ever go to a line, you're like, no, we're not doing this, it's not going to work. So, um, we had a lawn that was really, really small. So every lawn has its own personality. And some are way more difficult than others. Um, we had a lawn that was really, really small. One of our first lawns before my time with Fleet. I started this, this past year, but we've been, we've been operating since 2014. And it was tiny, so I just made it into an herb garden. But they recently wanted it expanded, so they took out some trees, and so we expanded it. Another um, instance, last summer, they didn't, Fleet Farming didn't want to keep the produce going because it was too hot. We didn't have that many volunteers. So they actually just added cover crops on each of the properties. So like watermelon, seminal pumpkin, or like sweet potato. One of the plots that has sweet potato on it, I have been pulling sweet potatoes out of that thing for over a year and it's driving me crazy. So I just put a huge tarp down to solarize it, get it hot, get that radiation from the sun and put it to work. And we basically cook the life out of the soil and start from zero. So you have to amend the soil a lot after that. So we're basically solarizing it right now. That's pretty much my biggest headache right now um, is that farmlet. But we always find a way to make it work. We use drip line irrigation. So homeowners have said that their water bill is about a dollar, a dollar extra a month. So it's very little water consumption. We put it on twice a day for about 10, 15 minutes. And you just stand back and let the plants do their thing. We haven't really had too many, too many headaches. Uh, the only, we don't have a lot of pest problems which I find to be terrifying because that means the earth is not healthy. When you have a lot of pests, you have a lot of life. When you have a lot of pests, you have a lot of birds. You have a lot of animals. When you have nothing, you have nothing. And so that is something that the, the biodiversity in the soil is something that I think connecting to the earth is really important. It's part of the process. People don't want to think of bugs on their food. It's like a stigma. But I asked one of my homeowners, he was buying a farmlet for his wife for her for Christmas. Cute. And he said, you know, I don't even know anything about farming. I just, she just loves you guys so much. And I, I just said, and I said, okay, well, I want you to look at your property Look at your neighbor's property. Look at their property. Do you see anything flying around? He said, no. And I said, do you see any bugs, flies, bees, birds, squirrels, anything? And he said, no, it's all grass. And I said, that's bad. That's bad. But we're so turned off. We get in our car, we all, oh, we're late for work, I gotta go, oh my god, I have finals, I, I just shove fast food in my mouth because I'm starving and I can't focus, I'm so hungry. You turn off that feeling of sterilization, you don't see it anymore. And that's another reason why I brought up Baldwin Park, because Baldwin Park is one of those, drive, those um, areas where I drive through it and my head is like, Oh my God, it's so sterile, it's so stagnated. I can't take it. It's like the Stedford Wives, you know? It's like everything is so manicured and perfect that people are turning off those sounds of nature and they're just numb to it. They don't hear it. The only pest problems that we have are peacocks. <laughs> they eat our kale and they attack us. <laughs> 
You think I'm kidding. I have been attacked. No, Moses? Peacocks? If you ever see a peacock, spray him with a hose. <laughs> because I will tell you right now, they can eat kale by the root and just gobble it down like it's nothing. And uh, yeah, they walk right up to you like this. <laughs> you know? And uh, they're not even scared of our cat, who's like a monster. So that's pretty much the only problem that we have. I, um, you know, back when I was dealing with a lot of my emotional, you know, issues, the only release that I had was going outside and sitting in my garden. And you're going to think I'm nuts, but please hear me out, okay? You guys can talk bad about me after and be like, that chick was crazy. Nature responds to you the more that you incorporate it in your day to day. Mother Nature gives you medicine. It also gives you free therapy. And every day, I would have my coffee and sit in the grass in the same spot and just watch my surroundings. And I promise you, the lizards started to know me. <laughs> the lizards stopped running away. I started noticing the same family because one had like a crazy crooked tail. And they started, I was, I was to the point where I could pick them up and they wouldn't run because they knew I wasn't a threat. Do you think I'm nuts? Try it, I dare you. It's fascinating how soon when you're so um, incorporated in your surroundings that you build this bond that we turn off when we start getting into adulthood. And that is, to me, the deeper meaning behind what we're doing. It's more than just food. I'm trying to connect people again to that natural process in every way. Before I ramble too much, I want to tell you a little bit about when I was growing up. My, I'm Native American, Puerto Rican, Cape Verdean, French Canadian. I'm a whole slew of things. But I'm Native American, and my mom, she, uh, back when she used to practice a little bit more, we would go to powwows, and we would travel all across Massachusetts. And when we would see a dead animal on the side of the road, my mom would pull over, take out the sage, and next thing you know, I'm plucking feathers out of a hawk and putting them in a bag. <laughs> okay, this is real. I grew up eating meat, too. And the, the, but the way that I was taught how to eat meat was to appreciate the animal. So when we would take out the feathers and bring out the sage, we were basically, my mom would say, this is just a body now. Its soul is gone. But you thank the soul for its time here by using the body in every way. You don't just eat a chicken wing throw out the bone, and then just get another 20 piece, you know? You value and respect the animal by using every single piece of it. When you are in, I'm a, I'm a Wampanoag Native American. Hypothetically, if they killed a deer, they would use the bones to make beads. They would use the, the horns. They would use the skin. They, of course, would eat the meat. Every single piece of it would be eaten as a community. It would not be, this deer is mine. It would be, look, this deer is ours. They would thank the animal for its time and for its body and its resources, and then they would embrace it. So I would go to school with raccoon fur and stuff and like ferret tails in my hair. Swear! I don't have any pictures of that, thank goodness. But that was how I was raised. And I think that should be something that we turn back on in ourselves. So, tangent over. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, so you mentioned you have a waiting list right now? Yes. So how, what are the barriers for you guys to grow? You know, and is, there, is that something you want to do? Or, or right now are you concerned about you know, having too much food or whatever? But if you guys do want to grow, and expand even in the city to other parts of the city like 
are there barriers even even in terms of us being aware of fighting for like trying to help you get the city to approve certain things or like you know trying to be on your on your team or support you guys as it relates to things that you know people are against this type of idea or wanting to allow this to happen in their communities as you go beyond Audubon? I'm so happy you asked that question. So HOAs are our enemy. Get on the board of your HOA. Fight from within. I'm not trying to brainwash you, but really. <laughs> fight from within, please. Because remember how I said that we fuel the demand and so we're actually contributing to that surplus of waste because we keep wanting? HOAs keep regulating to the point where those manicured lawns are the norm and that is what we are teaching our children is beautiful. If I didn't tell my homeowner that the environment that he was in was sterile, he didn't notice until I taught him that. So HOAs, in trying to keep this ordinance and in trying to restrict how, what percentage of your lawn you use for what, they are teaching people that that manicured sterile Baldwin Park look is cool, it's cute, it's nice, and it's actually devastating to the environment. So HOAs are a huge problem. In hopes, that, like well, I would love to expand, one of our biggest issues is that there's just me and one other person and then we have our installation manager. So we are slowly building that infrastructure to grow in Audubon as well as, you know, we have a branch in Oakland, California. Um, we also are expanding. We received a grant from the USDA to open a branch in Paramore, Southwest Orlando, a food desert. Food desert, born and raised in a food desert, going to bring food to food deserts. It's full circle. How cool is that? I've got a crazy infinity sign for a reason, you know? Full circle, let's do it together. But um, part of that is just the people. I don't want to expand too rapidly because of quality control. I don't want to have 80 farmlets and 60 of them look crappy because I just can't get to them. So we're, we're, it's a very um, strategic growth, but it's happening rapidly. In the past eight months, I've opened five farmlets and I've connected with three more vendors and I just keep getting more inquiries. So we're slowly growing with the community. Like I said, our last swarm ride was the largest we've ever had, 55 people. So the word is getting out. We had people coming from Mount Dora and Melbourne. They woke up at probably six in the morning to drive out to a swarm ride. That's awesome. So it's a calculated growth. We got time for one more question. One more question. Oh, make it good. I'm ready. Nobody? Moses, man, hook me up with a question. No? All right, well, thank you.